again, I'm Jack West. I'm a medical oncologist at City of Hope Cancer Center in the Los Angeles area and uh, pre founder and president of GRACE, Dr. Millie Doss of Stanford University and uh, the Palo Alto VA, yep. and Dr. Matt Gubins at University of California, San Francisco, in San Francisco, obviously. Thanks a lot. Uh, we're going to be talking about the setting of stage three or locally advanced non-small cell lung cancer. And just by introduction, I would say that it's a common setting that about 30%, somewhere in the range of a third of our patients with lung cancer present with stage three disease. And I think that one of the challenges, the complexities is the range of what is called stage three that can include just a, a microscopically involved lymph node in the, one of the lymph nodes, I'm sorry, in the middle of the chest between the lungs. Uh, it can involve multiple lymph nodes throughout the middle of the chest. They could be quite bulky. And sometimes it is appropriate to really consider surgery for some of these patients. But in the majority of patients with stage three disease, they are probably not well served by doing surgery once you have many lymph nodes involved or more bulky disease. So if you have a patient with multi-station, that is many lymph nodes involved, uh, N2 disease, stage three, you decide that this is not a patient well served by, uh, by uh, surgery. Do you order molecular tests for this? The, a setting like stage four, we routinely do, but in stage three, it's not clear whether we would use this information or whether you would order molecular testing. So if you have someone, say, with an adenocarcinoma, which is one that would have a reasonable chance of having a mutation, do you order it? Uh, and think how this might inform your, your management, or do you say this is not a setting where that's standard, don't ask, don't tell, it's only going to complicate things. So what is your approach for a patient who would otherwise be a, a candidate for chemo and radiation followed by typically immune-based therapy? Matt? Yeah, so I think that's a really important point that we – in the academic setting, we kind of always want as much information as we can get. And so I think from our point of view, we're always getting it mostly to kind of triage patients for potential involvement in clinical trials. There's also an element of prognosis. We do know that even stage for stage, certain mutations might actually portend better outcomes. But I think another practical reason is, and we'll talk a lot about, we're treating these patients for cure. Um, we hope that our chemo and radiation plus or minus surgery plus or minus immunotherapy is going to cure the patient, but uh, uh, still a majority of these patients will progress. And sometimes it's nice to have this information in our back pocket so that if and when they do progress, we're not starting from scratch and starting that four week clock toward getting those data to get them started on treatment. So for all those reasons, we do tend to get it, but I fully acknowledge that generally I'm not going to use it in my treatment decisions for mm -hmm. these patients. Do you think it should be a any kind of standard of care? I mean, do you, what, what, if a colleague out in the community asks you if they should be doing it, do you say it's an option, but not a standard, or do you recommend it? That's probably how I would pitch it as an option, not a standard. That's how I would pitch That's it. That's exactly Nellie? what I would say. I, you know, I don't think it really informs our treatment decisions right now outside of a clinical trial. Uh, we did have the energy oncology trial um, open at Stanford where patients with EGFR and ALK um, were randomized to receive either, you know, targeted therapy, a lead in a two months targeted therapy followed by chemo radiation versus just going straight to chemo, chemo radiation. So of course, in that context, it was important to know whether a patient has EGFR or ALK. Although I think that study, I think has closed because it's, it is tough to get that information and it's not part of, you know, standard practice. And so it's not something I, I, I would generally do as, uh, or, recommend a standard practice. But again, in an academic setting, I think it's useful to have that information. From a practical standpoint, I've asked our pathologist to send uh, molecular testing on any lung cancer specimen just as a reflexive testing. And so I, I do generally have that information, but I, you know, I, do I act on it in, in these patients with stage three disease? No, I'm generally not. 
do you uh, have any concerns, whether in your practice or for people out in the community, that this testing costs money and maybe won't be covered by an insurer? That's a good question. I, I think that's something to consider. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think I'm a little bit naive when it comes to that, working in an <laughs> academic and then also government um, you know, facilities. Uh, I don't think as much about that, but I think that that, that brings up a great point, especially if it's not going to alter your management. To cut to the chase, I would never tell a patient to spend five thousand dollars on these results. Right. You know, we Absolutely. usually get it; it either gets forgiven or the university kind of kind of eats the cost. But I, I completely agree that I wouldn't go out of my way to recommend it because it's not going to change practice in the short term. So, if you had a never smoker with an EGFR mutation that you identified, uh, the key trial that we use to guide our treatment for stage three lung cancer, which is called Pacific, gave chemo and radiation and then followed that with a year, up to a year of Imfinzi, Dervalimab immunotherapy in patients who hadn't progressed. And there's a clear survival benefit. This has become our standard of care. But in a subset analysis, looking at the various variables that seem to be associated with more or less benefit. The patients with an EGFR mutation did not seem to get a benefit. Mm -hmm. And in patients with stage four disease, the patients with an EGFR mutation often get pretty minimal benefit from immune therapy. Would that inform your decision? You both said that you generally wouldn't use molecular testing to guide decision making, but does this information about the subset of EGFR mutation positive patients lead you to feel that uh, you'd be less enthused about recommending Infinzi or even consider giving, uh, giving an EGFR inhibitor as consolidation uh, in this setting? Millie? Yeah, I mean, I think that that does bring up a very good point. Um, so I think it's a conversation that you have with your patients. Um, and, you know, especially when we're not seeing that benefit and it's it's committing a patient to an additional year of therapy that otherwise they wouldn't necessarily need um, or be coming in for. Um, so talking to them about this particular subset analysis, I think one of the things that also comes up in these EGFR patients is if they do recur or progress um, after chemo radiation and you're going to be offering them osimertinib or Tegriso, there's some worry about the overlap of them having received Dervalumab and osimertinib and the risk of pneumonitis in that setting. And I think that that complicates things even more. Mm -hmm. um, so I probably wouldn't recommend the Dervalumab as strongly in an EGFR patient if I have that information up front. Um, again, have a conversation with them about that. And I would also just bring up the, the the concern for the risk of pneumonitis if we were to have to switch to, to osimertinib. So to have a thorough discussion and then come out of that as a shared decision about right. whether to pursue. Risks and benefits, exactly. Matt, what's your approach here? I think it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a tough issue. It warrants a lot of discussion. We have to kind of take a step back and realize that there are only about, I think, 44 or 45 patients with EGFR that were recognized on this trial. So we're talking about very small numbers. So I admit that to my patients. <laughs> and I've had this conversation with a couple of patients mm -hmm. who had EGFR mutations. And often these are very savvy patients anyway by their demographics. And we, I, I've shown them this, this slide that talks about how these patients did. With such a small patient population, it's hard to know what the real answer is. And the point <coughs> estimate, meaning kind of if you have to put a number down, how much did they benefit, did slightly favor Dervalumab or Imfinzi, but it just with huge, we call error bars, kind of a, a lot of variability that to, we don't really know the answer. Right. So the couple of patients I've talked about have chosen to do it, but I think all these points are well taken that you're committing patients to a year of drugs that... Granted, it's easier for most patients in chemo radiation, but has real honest to goodness side effects. And one of my EGFR patients came off for autoimmune diabetes. She will be on insulin for the rest of her life for a treatment that we're not sure improved her overall survival benefit. Right. For but any, on the other hand, you know, you're also, mm -hmm. this is the one we are looking for cure here. And I think patients are looking for anything that might even marginally add to that cure rate. Uh, EGFR inhibitors don't cure. To, as far as we know, with right. data we have. So I, it's a conversation, but I, I, I think uh, it does speak to the fact that we need to be including EGFR and in outpatients in these immunotherapy trials. A right. lot of the and, companies and, that run these trials them, exclude them. Study, study them. them more systematically yeah. than just with numbers. Yes. Exactly. And I, I think uh, that's important. You, you know, you make the very good point that 
A, these are patients who could be cured without this. I mean, before we were using immunotherapy, people did get cured. It's not uh, as common as we would like, but it's not astronomically low chances. It's maybe one in five, at best one in four, but possible that it the survival is better with immunotherapy. And I think because of that, in a high risk situation, it justifies kind of accepting some risk and going for the brass ring. But but we do need to not be cavalier about the risks of bad interactions, like if we are going to be giving to Grisso afterward if they progress. So these are tough questions. Yeah. And I will say for those patients, uh, for generally on on Durvalumab on Infinzi, I will get imaging every three months, but especially for that EGFR patient, I sure want to find that progression if it's going to happen early. I want to have a chance to wash out the Durvalumab so that I'm even more kind of attentive to that patient and, and then their progress over that year of immunotherapy. Mm-hmm.